perhaps I, I could say a few words while we wait for the late stragglers. Um, okay. I just wanted, uh, on behalf of all your robots, to welcome everybody, to thank you all for attending. This is the first your robot seminar of this academic year. Um, if, if you hear, you perhaps have heard about your robots, but uh, in case you haven't, your robots is a network of uh, academics, re researchers at all levels at the University of War, your working in the area of robotics. Uh, in spite of all the situation with the child, we, are, we remain very active. And uh, I'd like to thank Anna for contributing to the, to the restart of our series. We had to cancel uh, uh, the speaker, but it's very, very, very nice that he was able to join us. He's a very, very senior speaker. I'm looking very much forward to, to this talk today. Your robots involves uh, or is represented by researchers in 11 departments. Robotics at the University of York is a very multidisciplinary activity. I'd like you to all uh, think about joining, if you haven't yet, the email list of your robots, RAS hyphen group, you can subscribe and we will find out about the very many lovely seminars, events, fun opportunities that uh, we promote. So welcome and Anna, Dennis, thank you very much. Thanks Anna. So, um... And thanks to you, Themis, for agreeing to join us. It seems like a, a very long time ago since we discussed Themis coming to York in person. And now, obviously, a lot has happened between then uh, and now. So we are really glad that you can join us, Themis. Thank you. Um, if it's all right with you, then I'll introduce you uh, a bit more uh, thoroughly. Um, and then we can launch straight in. Um, but something that I've learned from, from my colleagues is that uh, it's usually better to know in advance um, how we should hold on to questions. But I think uh, it would be good for our audience, if you have some questions, jot them down uh, and hang on until the end. I think that would be the, the best way to, uh, to do that. Uh, so Themis is a professor of nanotechnology uh, and also the director of the Centre for Electronics Frontiers at the University of Southampton, where he focuses on developing metal oxide resistive random access memory technologies and circuits for embedded applications. Uh, he also holds a Royal Academy of Engineering chair, which is the same uh, chair uh, position as Anna Cavalcanti also holds, because that's in emerging technologies. Um, but uh, Theris's chair focuses on developing novel power efficient AI hardware solutions uh, and also a Royal Society Industry Fellowship. Now, it seems to me that because Themis likes to keep busy, uh, he's also the director of the Lloyd's Register Foundation funded International Consortium of Nanotechnology, and that's how he and I first met. Uh, and that supports 50 or so PhD studentships, uh, and he's also the co-director of the UKRI Centre for Doctoral Training, as well as founding a couple of companies in the last few years. So Themis, I don't really know how you have time to do anything, uh, but I'm delighted that you found the time to join us. Um, so if you're ready for us, then uh, please do feel free to share your screen. Uh, and we can get started. So first of all, thanks for the for the, for your invitation, Anna. And uh, and uh, uh, I was hoping that you know the introduction would not be as thorough as 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 what you you know sort of placed it. But thank you so much. It's really a pleasure uh, to sort of meet all of you, even you know like uh, through these uh, unprecedented circumstances. Hopefully, when the when the time permits, I will be able to to join you physically and and visit you. Uh, up in the north. So today I'll, I'll, I'll talk a bit about uh, our work we've been doing over the past couple of years on what I like to call AI on a chip. I mean, we heard this expression previously in terms of, you know, like putting labs on chips, putting, you know, all sorts of different stuff on chip. But I think one, one important uh, aspect in these, uh, uh, in these era is how we can actually embed intelligence everywhere. And in order to do that, we need to identify what the challenges on hardware uh, are. So. Uh, hopefully you could see my screen. Uh, so I'll start first of all by with a disclaimer that I'm an engineer, and uh, and as as an engineer, uh, I don't know so much about robotics, but uh, I, I do like to spend a lot of time uh, with my colleagues and my students in our clean room facilities. And this this is basically what attracted me from Imperial that I was previously in Berkeley in the States to come at Southampton. We have a quarter of a billion pounds in a clean room facility, which is unique worldwide, which really allows us to do some of the type of research that I will explain later on. So just a brief outline of the of my talk, I'll try to cover um, the modern electronics challenges and what the AI, new AI era needs. Uh, 
probably I'm, 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 I'm preaching to the converted here because you all, all are familiar with uh, what I'll be saying most probably, but I'll introduce memory stores and the work that we do there. And I appreciate that I uh, uh, probably have a, a rather diverse audience. So I'll try not to get into uh, very technical details or, or uh, too much on the material side of the front because there's a lot of uh, interdisciplinary research that's happening there. And then I'll try to focus more on applications, some examples on applications and conclude. So it's, it's clear that our AI is as good as our access to data nowadays. And uh, uh, we've already exceeded uh, the, what this graph shows, which is uh, the, uh, um, the plan was that we'll probably have about 50 billion interconnected devices. And I think we've reached somewhere in the order of 200 billion nowadays. The thing is, now these interconnected devices generated the loss of data and and this this sort of data consumes so much power that it's predicted by 2025 we will be consuming at least the fifth of global electricity simply from for handling the data so we do need to do something even even if we were not to you know just consider of any further progress in what ai means so there it's everyone's been very clear about this that big data requires to be uh, uh, affiliated also and supported by a hardware revolution. And the key engineering challenge that uh, I've been focusing my career on is how we can actually change the fact that uh, so far we've been relying on uh, electronics where the fundamental design of, of memory and processing are not being collocated places really a limit of what can be achieved. So how can we go from a classical von Neumann to a non von Neumann sort of architecture? At the same time, uh, as we start scaling devices further and further, it's, it's really impressive nowadays to consider that the latest smartphones, they have about 15, 15 one, 5 billion interconnected devices, transistors, uh, on which all these uh, amazing intelligence runs. But uh, in order to reach there, we've been making our switches, our transistors smaller and smaller, but we reached to a point where industry and the foundries Last year, a uh, global foundry mentioned that they will be stopping further investment into further scaling simply because it is not sustainable. So we, we're now hitting really the, uh, the bottom as, uh, as Feynman would say, that there is plenty of room at the bottom, but actually we've re really, really hitting the bottom now. So we need to do something about this. Memoristic technologies, uh, pose an interesting alternative beyond CMOS, beyond the conventional electronic technologies. And uh, first of all, uh, a couple of introductions. Uh, memory store stands from uh, uh, short for uh, the terminology memory resistor. And this was coined as, as a term from the chap on the left hand side. I don't know if you can see my cursor moving. My, the, left, the guy on the left hand side is Professor Leon Chua, who back in the 70s a professor at UC Berkeley, with whom I've actually spent some time at Berkeley within his lab. He simply from a symmetry point of argument poised the question saying that there must be a component that he called memory store linking charge with flux. As for example, we have the resistor linking voltage and current. So entirely from a symmetry point of view, from the theory point of view, he poised the uh, existence of this component and he, he predicted how this component should actually behave which is nothing more that when you stimulate it with a, a, a sinusoidal sort of a voltage wave, the, the current that you measure lags in terms of the maxima and minima, and then therefore you observe in the current voltage domain nothing more than this pins hysteresis loop, which looks like a, an innate shape. Now the, the guy on the right hand side is Stanley Williams, who uh, a, a bit over 10 years ago, he was working on two terminal devices, metal insulator metal, uh, based on titanium oxide for next generation of memory technologies. And his success was that he managed to uh, experimentally demonstrate this, uh, this behavior. But his, really his big success was that he correlated that with the theory that Leon Chua predicted you know, over 40 years ago in this very famous uh, paper in Nature that they found the missing memory store. Now, uh, this this isn't new and we have to be very careful here and i've uh, i've been quite vocal about this writing commentaries in nature and and uh, uh, there is always 
a little bit of reinventing the wheel sort of attitude in science. So we have to be very, very aware of all of that. In fact, I had a, an, an, a commentary in Nature Materials uh, published a few years ago uh, where I've proven that uh, uh, Memristos is, is a subject that is almost two, two centuries old. Even back in the days of Faraday, uh, they were experiencing this type of behavior. So why should we actually care? We care because these devices are highly, and when I say highly scalable, I'm showing you some of the examples produced in my labs here. So this, this that looks like a carpet here is an array of these uh, crossbar uh, devices, where, uh, and they occupy about one by one micrometer. So within a, a one micrometer square, you actually have 1,024 devices. So just a couple of atoms wide. So it's highly scalable, but at the same time, they achieve more for less. And what I mean by that, so less space, as I've shown you already, but more memory states. So instead of having switches like transistors that allow you to, to store zeros and ones, we've demonstrated and we still hold the state of art in terms of analog memory uh, capacity, where we've demonstrated even up to seven bits over 100 memory, distinct memory cell uh, uh, memory states. And these are non-volatile, which is uh, quite exciting. What we mean by non-volatile is that you don't need to actually burn any energy to maintain that state. You just pro program it once and it stays there for as long as, as the material system can actually support it. In this case, you see like retention characteristics for over eight hours. So imagine you have your computer, you save everything, you shut your screen, and then you open it up. And again, everything is powered up and is exactly where it was. Uh, on the other side, it only consumes minimum energy. So this is picojoules of energy shown here on the bottom right hand side. And, and you can see how you can access all these different individual memory steps. So essentially it's like having a trimming element, like a tunable resistor that uh, you can store a number of different memory resistive states. So in, enough of the, uh, I hope this is clear for now. I, I felt that it's useful to, to put uh, a little bit background on what memristors are and, and why should we actually care. Uh, so what can we do with this? So first of all, one example, which is of, of the obvious example would be, you know, to use that to replace all non-volatile memory storage that we have in our PCs, etc. But today I'm going to talk about applications beyond memory, mainly showing how we can exploit this for, for example, the first, first example is about performing in silico machine learning implementations. So uh, Eric Kandel in, in the 2000s, he got the Nobel Prize in Physiology because he demonstrated that memory is transcribed in chemical synapses in biological systems. And, and if you look how a, mem a, a chemical synapse looks like, if you look here on the right hand side, again, abstractly as an engineer, what I see is, is there, there are these two terminals, so a pre and a postsynaptic a neuronal terminal, and you have a barrier, which is nothing more than synaptic cleft, in which neurotransmitters uh, are diffused through the opening and closing of these ion channels. So when I see that as an engineer, that resembles to me a lot the following, which is nothing more than a cross-section from one of our uh, uh, actual prototypes, our, our memristors. So you have two terminals, the denoted in blue here, which is platinum, the top and the bottom electrode. You have a barrier in between, you, which is a titanium oxide layer, and you allow oxygen vacancies and titanium interstitials to move up and down in a rather similar fashion to biological chemical synapses. So we took that and we demonstrated for the first time a couple of years ago how these devices can actually be, uh, first of all, uh, perform as analog memory devices, uh, you see that there is a certain operation regime that this can be utilized. So the, this is the voltage bias. Uh, uh, you need to exceed a, a certain switching threshold in order to trigger a change in the resistance. And, and once you do that, you can develop, you can run a number of different learning rules and learning protocols with it on these devices to potentiate, so increase the conductance or depress uh, decrease the conductance of the devices. But the beauty here is that the, the change of the state is dependent on the history of the device. So what we show here is that, for example, if your device is at relatively 
low conductance and you're trying to push it in a higher conductance, so you're trying to learn something, the first time that you're learning something, it's quite easy to do so. And vice versa, if you're already up there and you're trying to do the opposite, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's easy. But if you're already in a relatively large conductance and you try to go even higher up, it's difficult. So we use that to encode conditional probabilities embedded within signals. And, uh, and demonstrate for the first time with this simple winner take all network uh, in silico after neural networks. Uh, I have to say that this was one of the very few to early career researchers here that were listening to us, that this was one of, one of the very few times where we got some very useful and constructive feedback through the review process uh, in, in nature where the reviewer said, this works really nicely, but uh, how about if you were to implement it with probabilistic neurons? Uh, and, there, and therefore we did that. And we've seen that actually this topology works even better because it allows you to also to, to handle mistakes embedded in the signals, you know, like quite well. So what you see here is the initial response of the system and the final response where, where the system uh, uh, becomes trained uh, autonomously. Uh, and uh, it's able to recognize the different patterns embedded in the, si in the system, in the signals. So bear in mind that because it's unsupervised learning, this is, this is fantastic for implementation for embedded type of applications where the class centers drift over time. So you can actually let the system self-learn and then autonomously try to figure out how the classes centers move over, over time and, uh, and start classifying that again. So that, that's just one example. A second example has to do with energy efficient Bayesian, Bayesian inference. And uh, uh, everyone is quite interested in nowadays in Bayesian inference and computing directly in the probability domain. It's something that's quite exciting for hardware. Uh, I don't want to really bother you with the details uh, here on how exactly this was done, but essentially we're using as simple as, uh, as that, we're using, we're using passive crossbar arrays of memory stores and implementing simply Kirchhoff's law that allows us to add currents over rows and columns and, and allow us to do vector matrix, vector multiplication, uh, uh, and uh, you know, by simply using passive arrays. Multiplication is one of the most expensive operations, if you like, if one is to implement this in, in hardware. So in terms of uh, how many transistors you need to do that, how much power you need to burn in order to do that. So, so having such a simple and elegant uh, approach to, to demonstrate that uh, it's, it's really fantastic. It's lowering quite a lot the constraints of, in terms of power consumption. And, and that's actually some work that we did collaboratively with uh, some colleagues from uh, ECS from the computer science department uh, uh, that we presented at NIPS. So a third example, is, uh, is uh, trying to look at new and alternative paradigms. And uh, you probably heard it many times whenever someone is talking about a new technology, everyone is promising that, you know, uh, we, will, we will disrupt the paradigms, etc. But here we actually believe that we did something like that and I'll explain how. So first of all, our world is analog. We don't see, smell, sense, with a fixed bit precision. We are continuously processing analog signals, but nonetheless for the power constraints that I mentioned previously and the scalability constraints of the technologies, our electronics is mainly operating in digital. So we have two very dissimilar words that need to be interfaced and that's always posing a lot of, a lot of challenges. How do you do the transformation between the different domains and, and you know, how can you become even more competitive? Now, the thing is that if we look at the different paradigms in circuits design, we have digital, we have analog, and we also have the so-called mixed signal, which where the mixing of the two happens, but nonetheless, the mixing is happened at signal level only, as the paradigm says. Uh, if you look at the underpinning technologies, still this remains separable. And, and this is problematic because still we need to handle data and push data back and forth, which causes latencies and causes additional power consumption in data buses. What we've done here is, is we try to effectively marriage the two, 
these very two dissimilar words by the introduction of these analog memory uh, devices, these memory stores, with standard digital logic. So here is an example of a, a primitive component, uh, an inverter, where you would expect to get this, uh, uh, this very typical transfer function characteristics for an inverter. But what happens if you start introducing these analog components in here? You actually skew the transfer characteristics of your inverter and you end up having something that is, uh, uh, that is allowing you to perform analog computation. And, and the, the beauty of this is that you can go and reconfigure obviously these memory states. So immediately by, by reconfiguring this, you can shape and you can tune these analog uh, reconfigurable gates as you wish. Uh, and you might say, why, why would this be uh, uh, useful? Here's just yet another example that is using this concept. And with a very simple uh, uh, readout circuit, we're able to store different values here for a create in silico classifiers that are very, very efficient instead of relying, for example, to deep learning networks that indeed they are extremely efficient, but they consume a lot of resources, a lot of layers, a lot of time for training. Uh, here you, we develop essentially very, very bespoke classifiers that are looking for very specific patterns. And this is extremely uh, uh, power efficient because it typically sits idle consuming minimum power. And whenever you find the target, it raises a flag, it says, here it is, I got it. The beauty of this is that even when you are far off this, uh, 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 this sort of domain that you are of interest, it tells you, this system tells you which way you need to move, which is really nice. And then uh, why would that be useful? Uh, again, classification and uh, embedded classification is, is, is key into many different applications. Here, we're just demonstrating that you can take this concept scale it and array it into what we call, you know, it's a template matching pixel essentially. Uh, and you can scale it and you can array it and you can start looking at different biosignals in this particular case. What do you use it for in the end of the day? It doesn't, it doesn't really matter because all, all of it is data in the end of the day, whether it's for natural language processing, whether it's for, uh, you know, for image processing, you know, you can still utilize that. And that the only thing that it would actually change is the number of, of uh, pixels that you can actually tessellate in an array. So moving on, uh, here is yet another example that employs the device physics, but for sensory data compression. So everyone is talking nowadays how important it is to, uh, to devolve some of the computation that happens in the cloud to the edge. What do we mean to the edge, right? Because again, that has many different connotations, many different meanings. Uh, uh, perhaps in the robotics community, it could mean <clears throat> within, you know, like a, the, the framework of a robot and the, com the onboard computer running that. Uh, for the smartphone community, of course, it means the smartphone, uh, the handheld device. Here specifically, we're talking at device level, so at the individual memory store. So uh, uh, allow me to explain a little bit more for that. So if you look at a standard memory device, like the ones that we prototype, if you start stimulating it with voltage pulses, nothing happens until you exceed the switching threshold. So ideally you have these two uh, uh, thresholds, which is a soft breakdown and a hard breakdown. Above this, the red area, we don't want to be because we're causing irreversible damage into our oxides and our devices, but this is where the magic happens, the reversible switching. So below that, nothing happens. There is no, no change in the conductance of the device as also shown here with this sort of data. So as you start exceeding the, going over these thresholds, you start registering this non-volatile change in resistance. Now, if you take th this, as, as I show you here, essentially this demonstrates that the device has the intrinsic characteristics of a, a threshold voltage integrator that we can, uh, we can actually utilize it. And in, in integration is fantastic always for sensing. And, and, and that's exactly what we did. Here are some, just some examples with colleagues from the Max Planck Institute where we were getting biosignals for a, from a rat neurons, uh, sensing those with a multi-transistor array, and then just converting those into a appropriate sort of pre-amplifying these signals so that we can uh, induce changes in conductance. Uh, now, what is very interesting here is the, the information is always inhibited 
in the uh, uh, conveyed, if you like, in the spiking events here of these biosignals. Now, there are two things that uh, uh, people in the electrophysiology community are interested in, that is whether there is an activity, so whether there is a spiking event, which is known as spike detection, but also to which neuron that spiking activity belongs to, which is uh, uh, essentially spike sorting, right? So in this particular case, we know nothing about the number of events that exist. And when we bias these, these devices with this type of signals, you see changes in the resistive states that are you know, done in a, in a passive kind of way. Uh, if, you, if you take this input and you, you invert it, you could see that uh, there is an analogous change in the other side, resistance and so forth. So that, that's just a sanity check. But through that, we can actually count events. Uh, and uh, this is shown much nicer here where you see three different types of events and you see each one of them registering a, cha a corresponding change in resistance. Now, this is important because in, in other ways, we would actually need to uh, uh, spend a lot of power. In this particular case, we demonstrated at least two to three orders of magnitude reduction in terms of power consumption per channel from the state of art system that does spike detection. And, and, and this is happening because simply we, we, we do not have to be continuously on. The devices, we do not need to oversample, uh, you know, like our, our uh, multi-transistor arrays so that we can make sure that we monitor every single event. And the devices passively accumulate this information. But the other beauty of this is that not only they do that, but they, depending on the envelope of the signal, they change their, their resistance in a corresponding way. And because they do that without really bothering you too much in the details, you're also able not just to perform spike detection, but also spike sorting. Because if you were to plot it in this particular way, where you're looking at the fractional changes of resistance per event, you will see this, uh, these lots appearing naturally. So instead of doing template matching externally, uh, which, which causes a lot of uh, uh, constraints in terms of the bandwidth and in terms of power consumption, you probably need a supercomputer to do that at large scale. Uh, you can actually do that, delegate that really at the edge, at the device level. Now, why is this important? Allow me to say just a final point on this example, because bear in mind that most neuromorphic type of uh, uh, sensors nowadays whether it's uh, smart imagers or, or microphones, et cetera, they operate with spiking events. So although this was originally developed for, uh, for biosignal analysis and for electrophysiology, a, a tool for electrophysiology, this is actually fantastically applicable to so many different other areas that spiking events are utilized uh, in, in the communication. And, and, and the final example I believe I have here is once you have a device and a technology that uh, speaks the same language with biology, uh, immediately you, know, you have a, a great technology to act as the link between biology and engineering. And, uh, and this, is, this is a piece of work that we, we completed uh, sometime last year. It's part of a, a multi-project, multi-parties project, European project and done collaboratively with the ETH and the Institute of Neuroinformatics, the group of Giacomo Indiveri and, uh, and Stefano Vassanelli from Padova. What we've done uh, is we've demonstrated for the very first time that we can link through these devices, memoristic devices sitting at Southampton, we can link the, the, uh, the functioning of real neurons to artificial neurons. So essentially we've demonstrated for the very, very first time uh, uh, the link between real and artificial intelligence and, back, uh, and backwards as well. So we, we recorded the, uh, the activity of real neurons cultured on multi-transistor arrays. The signals were sent over UDP. By the way, this is an example that has attracted a lot of attention, not, not only because it's personally, I'm, I'm quite excited because it's really cool. It's the first time that real and artificial intelligence is merged bi-directionally in real time, but it was also done over the web. And, and it, it was actually an example that we did, uh, uh, which, which helped us really uh, a lot to continue with our research during this COVID lockdown, 
because we were simply doing that from uh, instruments that we've developed through one of my startup companies, as Anna mentioned, Arc Instruments, that allows uh, allowed us, uh, us as well as collaborators to to run this from uh, our bedrooms, essentially. So this this was really not obviously not the neurons, right? Uh, there are certain ethical constraints there, but uh, it, it was really great fun because we can do that over the web, and we can, uh, in fact, demonstrate a geographically distributed biohybrid neural network for the very, very first time. It's it's scary, but uh, it's it's extremely powerful. This was done for very, very few channels, and uh, and we're now working on, uh, which is reported in this paper in scientific reports, but we're now working on. Uh, on much larger scale sort of implementations to do real time interfacing. So, so really what's next? I mean, uh, Anna mentioned my uh, uh, Royal Academy of Engineering Chair in Emerging Technologies and I've spent the past uh, decades or decade or so from my career focusing on developing the technology, maturing the technology and the infrastructure and the tools that we need to have for using the technology. And now going forward, you know, we're focusing more, especially under my Royal Academy of Engineering chair in, in particular large scale implementations for AI chips. So we've identified four key computational pillars. I've already explained a few of them, the sensing front recognition with the in silico classification. Uh, how do we deal, how do we exploit these sort of new emerging technologies for continuously owned systems that they have? more and more needs in terms of memory storage. Uh, and uh, if you, for example, think of uh, biological systems, you know, it's, it's not, we, we still are constrained from a finite uh, uh, resources, number of resources, right? But we, we don't just do what, you know, like a, a, a hard disk will do whenever you reach its maximum capacity, let's say one terabyte capacity, you can't store anything else. We, this is known as the palimpsest problem, which is quite an exciting computational problem where we keep learning new things at top of old, one, old, of old memories. And we maintain both, but the compromise is how easy it is to recover old stuff, right? So that, that's, uh, we have already some preliminary work in that area, which is very exciting. And of course, reasoning. Uh, you know, if I was to ask you, uh, what is the dollar sign of the UK? Immediately, you would you would come up with with an answer. You know, you you will you will think that he is probably talking about the pound, right? What dollar sign? The pound, the pound. But if you were to ask a, a computer the same question, you will you will not get any any response simply because there are two data sets that are completely uncorrelated. Nonetheless, there are correlations there. So manipulating symbols and symbolic processing is something that we're quite excited with, which is obviously very exciting for robotics as well. And having hardware to do that, it's, it's truly exciting. And, and because I like to dream is, I, 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 the way I see that is that if you have these four core capabilities, which in my opinion define machine intelligence, machine intelligence essentially depends on uh, the ability of a machine to sense its environment, recognize some patterns, learn something out of that and reason. So you can, you can, you know, sort of pave the way towards thinking machines effectively. I've got a little video. Artificial intelligence is transforming the way we interact. It, it doesn't sound okay. Artificial Anna. intelligence is transforming the way we interact with the world. It allows us to automate routine tasks and even augment our abilities. Over time, the use of AI broadens, but so does the amount of data generated, driving current infrastructure to its limits demanding ever more data bandwidth and energy. We address this problem at its source, embedding intelligence everywhere by delivering AI on chips. Our solutions are powered by a new electronics fabric that we have developed over a decade of research, which uses nanotechnology to achieve computation, memory, and energy performance impossible to deliver by modern electronics. To support the creation of intelligent machines, our AI chips enable four core capabilities. Intelligent sensing, pattern recognition, online learning, and reasoning. Our sensing chips address the power and bandwidth challenges of big data by compressing information on site, allowing monitoring more sources in parallel. 
Our pattern recognition chips empower local classification capabilities, minimizing the need to share sensitive data online. By being less dependent on cloud computing, these emerging AI systems are able to react faster, allowing to make critical decisions in real time. Modern electronic systems are progressively operating continuously and often need to memorize events quickly and over longer periods. Our advanced learning solutions can support such emerging needs without saturating memory resources. Our solutions are designed in ways that they can empower machines to reason and apply logic and common sense like humans do, enabling them to use judgment when dealing with new situations. These core capabilities pave the way towards intelligent machines that are destined to revolutionize the use of AI in serving modern society, enabling smart assistants, autonomous vehicles, and neuroprosthetic devices. All made possible by our vision for embedding intelligence everywhere. So that, that's essentially in a nutshell the, the, the vision for the work that we're doing within my Royal Academy of Engineering chair. We already get, uh, you know, uh, uh, started developing some of these activities. Of, of course, COVID uh, caught with us, and, uh, uh, but you know, things are going quite well, I would say. So I mean, just in a nutshell, how could possibly the future look like? I think a key and exciting prospect is that, you know, the privacy of the data, the fact that, you know, you're able to change the, uh, where the computation happens and that business model uh, uh, provides some other exciting opportunities and by, by, by having, you know, not having to share your data continuously with the cloud, you're enabling other alternative unprecedented opportunities for the users. Maintaining the privacy is just one example, right? The, uh, I think in the video was also mentioned uh, the um, uh, real-time responses and uh, minimizing latencies, which could be also particularly important for autonomous vehicles, as well as uh, robotics. Uh, the other thing that we're working on as part of my Royal Society Industry Fellowship is collaboration with Galvani Bioelectronics, which uh, is uh, uh, spun out from uh, jointly from GSK and Google about three, four years ago with half a billion into that. And really the vision is that uh, the next generation of, of uh, medical interventions would rely on electronic devices that will be monitoring in, in real time our bio signals and intervening in situ, rather than using BRAC compounds that also have side effects. You, you can immediately see uh, uh, Anna et al, you know, like all the security implications and the ethical implications, and I'm very happy to discuss on that as well. And of course, because I said I'm, I'm, I'm a dreamer, I'd like to think that, you know, the, the work that we demonstrated recently really paved a very, very small step towards uh, the interaction of uh, artificial intelligence and real intelligence. What, how, what happens, I mean, if, for example, can you displace dysfunctional parts of the human brain with neuromorphic chips running in these technologies? For example, people suffering from Alzheimer's. Or can you get an upgrade yourself? I certainly might need one in a few years' time, or maybe even now. So as, as Feynman said, and I'm very uh, fond of Feynman, you know, what I cannot create, I do not understand. And I think there are really great opportunities to also utilize these technologies for modeling biological systems. Of course, there is a lot still that we need to do, and we've been quite vocal about this. Uh, and this is just one recent commentary we published in Nature Comms where we, we described, you know, what are the challenges hindering such neuromorphic hardware technologies from going mainstream. The technologies are still uh, at their inf infancy. So you can imagine there is loads of uh, issues with yield, with reproducibility, with availability of these technologies across different, you know, different groups. But we're getting there. I mean, Intel has already recently introduced products that depend on this type of technology. So, so you know, what's the space? And, and uh, uh, we're trying to do as much as possible on our side. So this is a, a service that we are trying to establish across the UK, which was uh, provided through a program grant that I'm leading called Forte, which is collaboratively uh, collaborative work between Southampton, Imperial and Manchester where we develop the technologies and, uh, and uh, we do that, the monolithic integration of these technologies together with CMOS circuits. Uh, uh, Southampton is uniquely located to do that because of the large scale 
uh, prototyping facilities that we have available. So now we, we're putting a recommendation there to provide this as a service to the broader electronics community in the UK. And there is there is a lot of excitement there because you know that can possibly give us an edge, if you like, in terms of the next generation of AI system. Of course, what I've described is, is, is not my work. It's, uh, it's uh, thanks to all of these fantastic uh, uh, people and, and of course uh, the funding that we had from uh, from a, a, a variety of sources, uh, mainly RC UK as well as Royal Academy of Engineering and uh, and different uh, foundations. So with that, I think I'll stop here and uh, hopefully we still have time for for question. We did. I hope we very much didn't lose everyone in the material sort of side of things or the technicalities. Uh, but I'd really be glad to get any questions. Thank you very much. That's uh, fascinating, and it's. Uh, I'm, I'm glad you're not looking to upgrade your own brain because uh, then you will be unstoppable. I think, um, but it's uh, it's nice to see that your group has thrived even in in 2020. Um, so really, I'd like to open the floor to our colleagues to uh, to ask some questions. Uh, perhaps you could unshare your screen, and then we could have um, people on a gallery view, um, which would help everyone to to see each other. Does anyone have any mm -hmm. questions? You're all currently muted, so you'll need to unmute yourselves. Uh, and I can't see everyone waving, so please do speak up. I have a question. Colin Patterson has a question. On it. Hi there. Thank you. It's uh, really interesting and exciting stuff. Um, I have, I, I, I'm sorry if this is a naive question or I misunderstood. Uh, you have some really interesting characteristics of your uh, electronics there that we end up going from binary to nonlinear analog features. I guess my question is, how does that change the stack that we need to have in terms of developing these things and even things like Obviously, my, my experience in neural networks, we understand the nonlinear characteristics and we can do the learning with respect to them. What, what do we have to do here? Um, does this change everything completely in the way we work with these electronics? It, it does. It's, it, this is a, a really exciting question, but very challenging, obviously. Uh, uh, so software needs to be co-developed, first of all, right? Uh, and, and also the way that we design our electronics, there needs to be, I, I kind of feel like we are, uh, I don't know, 70 years back when transistors and integrated circuits were introduced by Kilby and we're trying to figure out how we can actually do logic, right? So, so there are, the, the, the concept I've shared with you, which was published in Nature Comms, the only reason he made it into the Nature Group was because it was completely changing the perspective and, and it was as simple as saying, okay, we have an integrator, a digital, uh, you know, logic gate. What happens if we start introducing, you know, like these analog components in here, right? Which was, you know, as simple as that, but it led into so many different areas. And if you... If you look at the paper there, you will see there is a place start to unpick one by one of the opportunities that we have there. So you're absolutely right. We're still in, in the in infancy of the technologies. We're still developing all of that. And actually part of my program grant is exactly looking at providing and developing the technology as well as the infrastructure that goes with it. So for example, models. We work with cadence systems so that we can develop new design rules and new PDKs for, for people to design with, right? So it's, it's not easy. There is a hell of a work that needs to be done. But I think the opportunities are really, really exciting. And from, from the computational point of view, there are some unprecedented opportunities. And more computing allow you to, to highly parallelize processes computation and storage in one location. Thank you. I hope that answers. Yes, thank you very much. That we, we're still trying to figure out, you know, what's the best way. Well, so I think we've got a slight lag with the, uh, with the video. Um, I'm certainly- Any other questions? 
I'm certainly hearing a little bit of breakup, but uh, thanks so much for that one. Uh, anyone got any other questions, then just either let me know with, in the chat that you have a question. And uh, that's probably the, the easiest so that I can spot you um, or speak up. Stephen Wright has a question on, he raised his actual hand. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I was, you, you mentioned the um, irreversible switching stage and a reversible switching stage in the behavior of the device. Um, uh, I just wondered if there was a, uh, a life issue on the reversible, you know, because the device is history dependent, uh, is it something where the characteristics change over time so that the uh, device has a, a, a finite life? Yes, so uh, there's a couple of points there. So all electronic components have a finite lifetime, right? I mean, the same is true for standard flash, NAND memory, Okay, uh, and the same is true for memory stiff technologies. Uh, uh, the, the reason I've made it explicit about this irreversible uh, regime of switching is because we get a lot of uh, uh, reports in the literature of people showing this eight, eight kind of figure, this, uh, you know, pins hysteresis look, which is, uh, is not actually something that's, that's repeatable and reproducible, but it was the the source of a failure of a device that has actually, uh, you know, uh, broke down and uh, they've observed it once and that's it. So uh, failure is, uh, you know, resources uh, are, the more the resources are utilized within a device, the shorter the lifetime of that device. Okay. And then, and likewise, uh, maybe I, I use it as an example. Someone told me once, leave fast, die young, kind of, right? So the same is, is the same is true here for this type of devices. If you start using them at, you know, with large on-off ratios at the extremes and switch them on and off all the time, you would expect that the lifetime will be significantly reduced. Okay, thank you. Does it, uh, uh, does it drift before it fails or is it a hard failure? Uh, yeah, it depends how you reach to that point. Uh, so it's, it's not it's not a straightforward uh, uh, response there. However, we we have some recent work that we've done, one of my PhD students, where they've shown that you can actually recover devices by uh, exposing them into into higher humidities. You can actually the devices can can be reoxidized internally, and uh, and you can bring them back from death, which is very interesting. Okay, thank you. Any more questions, please? I, I have a question if all this don't. Um, but tell me if I could please uh, ask a, a, an unfair question. I think I, I'm sure you're aware that uh, uh, people have been very concerned about the use of AI and the possibility of uh, assuring and verifying these systems that are involved in learning as they, as they go along. And uh, there's been quite a lot of work on the use of mathematical techniques for verification of uh, learning uh, uh, applications. And of course, these mathematical techniques have in the past been extremely successful in the area of hardware design. So I, I wonder if uh, you would know about works in this particular area where people are taking the approach to, for mathematical verification of uh, applications in, in this area. I realize it's an emerging technology and perhaps there isn't, there hasn't been no time for that kind of thing to develop, but uh, just wondering. No, actually there is, there is quite a lot of work happening in that front as well. So uh, uh, I, just as an example, yesterday evening we had our, uh, similar to your seminar, uh, the Seth invited seminar, and we had someone, uh, uh, a senior developer from uh, Synopsys from California joining in to give a talk and he was talking about logic synthesis and verification and uh, and uh, it, it, as you could expect the, the discussion revolved in the end around what do we do about these emerging technologies as well and and they are on the case they are on the case because there's a lot of uh, once you have intel and the likes of intel getting involved in producing products you know that naturally happens i have to say it wasn't difficult for us to convince Cadence and a number of other big companies to be involved in this in this research and on and the research that we do in our program grant. In fact, we started with something like 
five or six industrial collaborators and probably we've, we've tripled. Oh, the, so uh, yes, definitely uh, it's, it's, it's something that uh, is uh, very important. The problem people have, the community has at the moment is the, that the, there is no particular flavor of technologies. We, bear in mind, there are loads of different materials that do the same stuff or similar kind of uh, switching. So until someone like TSMC, one of the key foundries comes on board and they say, they already do that by the way. And they say, this is a technology that we've developed and this is now becoming mainstream and mainstream and we provided you know a commercially available technology uh, that that would you know in, in Italy it would allow everyone else when they do verification logic synthesis etc to follow because at the moment it's a little bit segregated okay we got a program grant to do that within the the, the remit of the program grant but uh, I think that's as you know the best that you can actually do uh, if, if I may respond also, someone said in the previous comment about the how it was discovered by students, did someone spill water on one? Kind of, right? Uh, so we had, we were always struggling in finding, you know, like working devices in the group, right? So one of my PhD students that was part, uh, he, he was still at Imperial when I left. Uh, I was providing him with devices and he was burning these devices, you know, like, I don't know, one package per, per week or so. Uh, and these are quite expensive uh, at prototype state, stage. And at some point uh, he had a, a stack with all of his samples. And uh, because he ran out of devices, he went back and he started characterizing some of the old devices, which were all presumably dead, but they would be sitting on his desk for months, if not years. And he realized that the majority of them were actually all working. So this is kind of what triggered uh, the, the further ex uh, experiments we did, and we had the student who, who, who triggered it, you know, like by introducing these devices intentionally after they got into this irrevers irreversible sort of regime into high uh, uh, humidity type of environment to recover their operation. So yes, kind of by accident, a lot of stuff happened by accident. And my, my suggestion again to students and, and early career researchers is don't, don't be afraid to make mistakes and break things. As long as you don't break something super expensive, you know, like at the equipment and all of that, but the rest consumables is to be, you know, broken down and to use them. Otherwise you won't be able to discover anything. And perhaps never throw anything away. Uh, that could be your other advice, even if it's broken. <laughs> yes, um, indeed. So we have a question from Danish about uh, material, uh, sorry, about machine learning and applications. Danish. Thank you. Um, so just following from what Professor Cavalcanti said, um, I come from a background in advertising and data analytics. So excuse my ignorance if it's probably an answered question in the industry, something I don't know. But without trying to sound too George Orwell about this, um, how is the direction of this technology managed or regulated? Because if we're, if we're relying on machine learning to essentially mark its own homework, how do we as humans or engineers intervene to keep the learning in check? Because from my previous experience, what we designed as product designers in, for example, I worked in social engineering and advertising, it, we allowed the machine learning to assess itself and essentially upgrade itself. And what happened was what we planned compared to what the end result was, was completely different. So how do we manage this when AI or machine learning is capable of modifying and upgrading itself to such an extent? That's a brilliant question. In fact, the, the challenge here is even worse, uh, which, we, which we actually utilize as, as a benefit. And let, let me elaborate a little bit more on that. Uh, uh, you probably have seen in the news how uh, particularly Chinese firms that try to sort of reverse engineer designs of prototypes and they have these very, very elaborate techniques where they start uh, sort of uh, removing layer by layer from, from uh, uh, ASICs, from chips. And through uh, understanding what the architecture of the chip is, you can, you can uh, uh, understand what the functionality of that system is. Here is almost impossible to do that. So, so memoristic technologies are actually quite nice for, uh, for uh, embedding security in a way because you, uh, uh, you know, the, the actual operation is programmed within the device stack. 
in the way that the, the atoms within the device and interstitials are oriented. So there is no way to reverse engineer that from that point of view. All right, so that's why I meant that it's, it, it has an, a, a different connotation as well. Now, in terms of the ver verification and from a AI's point of view, this is exactly why we went down the route of symbolic processing because, uh, uh, I mean, it's important, especially for uh, assurance purposes to see where things go wrong, okay? And, uh, and uh, again, I'll give an example. If I was to ask, my my 10 years old old stance you know like what they did wrong at school if i was to use that exact language they would spin it around and say something that you know we didn't do anything wrong it was someone else's fault etc cetera, etc cetera. so i need to develop my own language in order to to interrogate them and get to the to the right question that i'm, I'm after so i think uh, the whole framework of symbolic processing and instead, and using that for a, a, a more uh, uh, transparent, if you like, AI operation in the system level, it's, a, it's a, a, in my opinion, an extremely powerful tool. And we did a, a, a project with DSTL and, and Talis in that particular domain, uh, which, uh, which kind of uh, triggered a lot of other actions there. So I think, I think that's probably the best way one can go about, rather than looking at what was the individual memory states per device, et cetera, et cetera. Even with conventional electronic technologies, you won't be able to do that, as you, as you rightly say. Thanks, Amy. So we've got time for just one more question that's coming from Matt Dale. Matt, do you want to ask this one live? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, I just wanted to ask, um, so variability is a big issue with memristors. Um, do you know anyone who's actually trying to use this? Because in many ways, I mean, a lot of work is about building a universal component that we can use to make cognitive systems, whereas they might not actually be universal components, that they will have variability in them. Is anyone actually trying to exploit this? That, yeah, that, again, that's a very, very nice question. So uh, just for everyone's interest, uh, you know, you, you fabricate a million devices and then its device will sort of diverge from the, its operating regime, you know, like you will have, which is typical for also commercially available electronics, right? Especially as you do more scaled versions of them. Uh, the same is true with memory stores and even more, right? Because we're developing, we're leveraging this highly rich dynamics based on these metal oxide redox operations. Uh, the, there, is, there are two ways of thinking here. There is the one which says where my program grant comes in and says, we would like to have as much as possible repeatable you know, uh, operation from device to device and cycle to cycle repeatability. And what we try to do there, of course, is improve the yield, improve the repeatability of our processes, but also develop mechanisms and tools that, that account for this type of variability. So the models, we build now statistical models that take into account thousands of measurements and provide you an operating regime to give you some confidence when you design an application. Uh, at the same time, uh, and I don't know whether you, you were reviewing a recent proposal of ours, there was this call for proposals recently on AI efficient uh, hardware for computing where uh, almost everyone I know from the neuromorphic computing in the, in the UK was involved with. And we had a collaborative program that we submitted there with Imperial where we said exactly the opposite. We said, let's accept whatever the variability is and let's take that as a feature and use AI to sort that out. Uh, uh, sadly, uh, the panel still hasn't happened, but sadly the, the reviewers couldn't really see what exactly was it that we were saying there, but uh, who knows. Uh, so uh, the, uh, the best of my knowledge, there aren't really many people at the moment talking about this aspect. I think there, there were some people with commercially available CMOS technologies because it said similar issues exist there, but not, not in memoristic technologies as far as I, I, I know. Great, thank you. 
Thank you very much, Semis, and thanks to uh, our audience for some interesting questions. It looks like you've got everybody thinking about what they can be doing and what other things they can be uh, not breaking. Um, so uh, it's been it's been really nice to to have you here with us, and it's been a really great way to kick off the uh, Your Robots series of seminars for for this year, academic year. So thank you very much for for being our first speaker for this year. Um, there will be more, uh, and so uh, anyone who's on our mailing list for the uh, Your Robots will uh, be getting emails about that. Uh, I can't promise they'll all be as fascinating as Themis, uh, but uh, we'll certainly try. Um, thanks again for, for all of you for attending, uh, and um, see you again soon. Thank you both. Thank you, Themis. Thank you very much. And thank you.